The Dallas Stars even the series after winning game four by a score of three to two. Tonight's Locked on Wild postcast begins right now. You are Locked on Wild postcast, part of Locked on Sports Minnesota, your team every day. The Dallas Stars draw even in game four of the series as they win three to two. And we now head back to Dallas with a 2 2 series. Seth Topal joined by Kevin Gorg as we break down all the action. Kevin, you knew the Stars were going to have to respond in this game after what happened to them in game three. And I think, honestly, the biggest factor here is that Jake Ottinger decided to crank his game up to another level. He was sensational. He was. He's a top five goalie in the world. He hadn't played like it so far in the series. Coming into this game, his save percentage was below 90. But you saw clearly tonight just how special a goalie this kid is. And Dallas was a different team, too. You could see in the opening five or six minutes, they had a couple of pipes. They were better leaving their zone. Uh, They're a good hockey team. They responded. And I thought Minnesota, though, got better as the night went on. I thought Minnesota was okay in the first. I thought they were fantastic in the second. And I thought they played well enough in the third. Five on five, they were the better hockey club. But as you know, in the playoffs, special teams and goaltending get magnified and matter more. Uh, There were a couple of opportunities throughout this game. It seemed like the Stars got tilted onto one side of the ice. You had a couple of instances where Kirill Kaprizov basically just walks it into the zone. But Jake Ottinger, I mean, I I think the total was eight um, odd man rush opportunities or breakaways, and he was nails on all of them. I got to tell you, the the breakaways they had, I liked both the, uh, the plan of attack by Marcus Foligno and by Kirill Kaprizov because Kaprizov's tell in this league is going high glove and Ottinger's a big kid and he's got that 6'5 frame and he tried to go five hole and he nearly got it. There was a rebound chance that almost was cashed in there and the Foligno breakaway, I mean, two great saves. I mean, Marcus got two good looks on that breakaway and and for Dallas, you know, you don't apologize for that because goaltending is a big, big part of playoff hockey. He was awesome tonight. And if you're Minnesota, you try to bottle up a lot of what you did tonight and bring it with you to Dallas for game five, because I think if Dean Everson's honest and we just got a chance to hear from him, he really liked what he saw. I mean, Minnesota's getting the odd number of rushes. Uh, they're the better team five on five. They've just got to shore up some things on the special teams. And this series is there for the taking. You get John Klingberg's first goal here of the postseason, And just one of those opportunities too. the wild were trailing two nothing at that point. And he is able to pick up a deflected pass. I think it was Zuccarello trying to get to the other side of the ice. It got deflected, but he picks it up and just that silky smooth oh. fling right into the net. And uh, at that point it looked like, all right, game on. And, from there, the Wilds, uh, they were right in it till the end. Yeah, and great shot by Klingberg. That puck was kind of bouncing a little bit, so it helped him kind of give it a little extra oomph off the pipe and in. And, you know, Minnesota's team, a team that, you know, we've watched this group now for a couple years, Seth, and they don't get down. Like, in the third period when Dallas went up 3-1, a lot of teams just go away and say, all right, the series is 2-2. But you know this team. You know how good they can be in six-on-five situations. They get a little break. As bad as some of the calls were on Felino, that call against Zuccarello uh, that gave Minnesota the extra attacker was a terrible call. Uh, but Minnesota took advantage. Freddie Gaudreau makes a play off a rebound. And, you know, we just got done listening to Coach Everson talk. And I agree that when a goalie's playing like Ottinger is right now, that first shot's not going to beat him. They're going to have to score some greasy, ugly goals around the net. And one thing you can do with a guy like this is make him move laterally and get that second and third look. We've seen that within this series it's there for the taking. It happened in game three, that opening goal. He was swimming on that one. But, man, when he gets a good look at the puck, I just don't think you're going to beat him. He's seen it pretty clearly right now. Well, and there were a couple of opportunities tonight. I think of the one that Marcus Johansson had on the other, the far side of the ice where Ottinger basically just let it glance right off. And if Johansson's able to get a clean look at it, he probably has a goal. Kaprizov had another one. And so, to your point, those rebounds are there. And as they continue to be there throughout the series – you feel like the Wild are going to get a couple. Well, I think for Minnesota, if you look at this pragmatically, you're 2-2, and Dallas has two of the last three at home. So you can say that, all right, well, Dallas earned that during the regular season. They had more points. They've earned home ice. But if I'm Minnesota, I look at it this way. You know, you're 2-2, and Boldy and Kaprizov are yet to score. And I think it's super important that the coaching staff sits down with them and you know, making sure they remain patient because this isn't about stats. Sooner or later – those two guys are going to get it going. And you're 2-2 in this series, and your best two goal scorers have one goal combined. So 
that can be a real factor here moving forward, especially if Minnesota can figure out their special teams and get that power play cooking. You know, and it's something we've talked about throughout the course of this series is that it's going to be a long series and you have to, at some point, tip your cap to what the other team does. And you're just, you're going to have runs. I mean, wild one game one. So they took one in Dallas. They're certainly capable of it. It's just, this is playoff hockey where you've got punch, you've got counter punch, you have both teams throwing as much as they can at the other team, and it's all about how you react. I think everybody that handicapped this series before it started felt like it was going to go six or seven, and likely seven. So none of this should surprise anybody. They split in Dallas. They split in Minnesota. Now Minnesota knows they have to win at least one game in Dallas to win this series, but there's no need to panic. You knew it was likely going to come down to the very end. Right now, you know, Minnesota feels good about their game. They're playing physical. That physical play, I think, can pay a dividend. If this continues to be a grinding series that maybe comes down to an eventual game seven, physical play has a way, a way of wearing teams down. And Dallas has some high-end talent, but they're paying the price right now. Uh, Kevin, Brock Faber again hmm. here in this one tonight. It seemed like Dallas tried to be more physical with him, but unflappable. Yeah, I just interviewed John Klingberg outside the locker room, and, and I, I teed him up in my fourth question with, listen, how's the chemistry coming with you and Brock Faber? Because they've only played a couple games together. And he took that question and basically went on a two-minute rant on how good this kid is, how calm he is, how mature he is, and, and what a talented player he's going to be. Now, Klingberg is a guy that's been around the block. He's seen a lot of players. He's played with a lot of high-end talent on blue lines all over, including Dallas, and he was gushing over this kid. And that's the thing I continue to hear from the wild coaches, from the players. Um, what you see on the ice, that calm demeanor is the same thing you see off the ice. He just looks like a pro and a pro that can do it at a high level. And so, yeah, the wild have clearly found something there. And uh, I, I really have been impressed with – not just Brock Faber, but with all the, the new faces, the way they've meshed with this hockey team, both on and off the ice, uh, it's been something to watch. I got to talk about one guy before we turn our attention to game five. We got to talk about Gustav Nyquist again. <laughs> just unbelievable hands. As we've talked about, we've talked about him a ton uh, here during these postcasts, but it seems like he's doing something every single game. And if that top line doesn't, get going you'll wonder if maybe he gets an opportunity to show his stuff with uh, with some of those guys regardless he's just playing fantastic well the, the thing about Nyquist is you can pretty much put him anywhere and and good things are going to happen he, he's good at a couple things and and number one he really sees the rink he, he's got what they call hockey sense but number two is he's able to possess the puck and be super patient. So he'll fit wherever you put him. And if you need to jumpstart a line and, and maybe want to shuffle a deck here in these final three games, if you're Dean Evison, you're absolutely right. Because if you put him with some high end guys, he'll get them the puck. I mean, you just watch the guy, the way he can control a shift, the way he's able to take a hit. Um, he's doing a lot of things well for this team. He's another one of those new faces that's really meshed well off the ice. I love the chemistry with this hockey team. And you wonder you know, you look at what happened last year in that series with St. Louis, and they laid an egg in game four. So it had a different feel when the Blues tied that up. You walked out of that rink last year on that Sunday and thought, man, the Wild might have let these guys off the hook. I didn't feel that way tonight. I, I leave the rink tonight thinking, if they play like this, if Minnesota continues to play this game, they're going to win the series. We'll talk more about that after the break because, uh, again, you look at what Dallas did tonight, top line, Outside of those power play opportunities, pretty quiet once again. So we'll talk about that and more as we continue tonight's Locked on Wild postcast after this. Minnesota Wilds end up losing 3-2 to two in Game 4 to the Dallas Stars. Seth Topol joined by Kevin Gorg live from the XL Energy Center. Kevin, you go back to Dallas. Dallas now has that last change. But from what I see, you have the Spurgeon-Middleton combo. You've got the Brodeen-Dumba combo. You've even got the Faber-Klingberg combo. And so, like with last year's postseason where maybe St. Louis was looking and saying, okay, we want to make sure that we get our top guys on that D pairing, you don't really have that in this postseason for the Wild. They've got three D pairs that are rolling pretty good. Yeah, I think they feel good about that end of it. And when Dean Everson is matched up with the opposition's top players, and I look at you know games we had earlier this year with teams like Edmonton and Colorado, he most worries about the defensive matchup. He all his lines. He doesn't really care which line is out there. He tries to get 
obviously a Brodine or a Spurgeon out there, but you've mentioned the way Brock Faber has played. Um, if you have to survive a shift with your third pair out there, I don't think that's a problem for this hockey team. And I think Minnesota's a better team now going to game five than, than they were before game number one. They weren't as healthy. Klingberg is back right now. We now know that Eck likely won't be a factor in this series, but you can plan for that. And I think for, for Dallas, you know, game two was awesome for them. I thought Minnesota really came out and, and made some mistakes that allowed that to happen. I don't see it being that type of game again. And Minnesota doesn't want to play that type of game. You're going to want to keep these games 2-1, 3-2, grind it out, let the physical play matter, hope it's more five-on-five five than special teams. And, and, and for the Wild right now, it's super important that they just look at it this way. It's a best of three. It's a race to four. Let's go down there on Tuesday night and give them our absolute best shot because the advantage for Minnesota in this series is if you can steal game five rather than let it come down to game seven, probably the easier of the two to win on the road. Then you can come back home in a building on a Friday night that's going to be unbelievably loud and have a chance to close out this series. Super interesting to see how the psychology plays out, but I think Tuesday is a great opportunity for the visitors. I know this is probably not something that a lot of Wild fans want to hear, but <laughs> you've got Marc-Andre Fleury as well. If you decide you want him in one of these final three games with two of them coming at Dallas, although I would say looking at uh, tonight's game, nothing that really Philip Gustafson could do. So I don't know. It's uh, it's a card in the deck that the Wild have uh, at their disposal if they uh, if they decide to go that way again. Yeah, it's it's nice to have that depth, and, and maybe you, you take a look and see how Gustafson bounces out of this one. He's new to the playoffs. I think, you know, he's learning game by game. It's it's a new experience. Ottinger went through it last year, and he's a better goalie for it. And, you know, I looked at the game tonight, and, you know, there were a couple pipes earlier where I watched and said, you know, being a former goalie, okay, he's a little bit off his angle, but not by much. And then as the game went on, he made some big saves. He looked good in the net. I, I just think, if I'm being honest, he has a calming influence yep. on this team. And if you're going to go into a tough building to play in, which, no question, Dallas has a great home ice advantage. Their crowd – is excellent. I think you're probably going to lean on Gus, try to go out there and settle things down early, make a couple of saves. And frankly, for most of this year, he's been good at home. He's been better on the road. Yeah. I think he plays a great road game and I think he can maybe help stabilize things. I'd be surprised if he wasn't in goal. Well, and, and something that you maybe don't think about as much, but because he ices the puck as much as he does, just gives opportunities for guys to just get a little bit of a reset. And, you know, you, you go out there on the ice, some rebounds kick around and you're out there in front of the net trying to defend for a long period of time. That just leads to some things happening for the other team. So a lot of those icings, just an opportunity for everybody to just take a breath and kind of get back to it. Seth, you make a great point because I think when teams are at home, especially teams like Dallas that have some super skilled players, they want to put a show on uh, for the home crowd. And if you're a goaltender that can shut that down and get some extra whistles, kind of clomp on the game a little bit, put the brakes on it, gives the, the road team a chance to settle in. It can also frustrate some of those high-end guys. And I think one of the players to keep an eye on that could, you know, Minnesota has to continue to do what they've been doing is Jason Robertson has not been good five on five. Yep. And, you know, if you can keep him off the score sheet, if you can continue to frustrate him a little bit, I think wild fans always get stuck looking at a well, Boldy hasn't scored. Well, Kaprizov only has one well, outside of game two, their high-end guys haven't done much in this series. And so there is a way uh, right now, if you're a wild fan to look at this and say, if we can, legitimately go out and keep that physical play up, stay out of the penalty box, limit it to two, maybe three power plays for Dallas each game. Five on five, the Wild, to me, look like the better hockey club, but Dallas' special teams are extraordinary, and that can be a difference maker if things get out of hand and, and Minnesota starts taking penalties. That could be a problem. And, and we saw from the penalty kill, they had a couple of instances in which they got part of the, uh, of the power play taken care of, some good clears. It's just... The MO with Dallas, get players in front of the net and just try to create some chaos and capitalize. Yeah, they, you look at their their forwards. It's a big group of forwards uh, for the Dallas Stars. So they're going to be at their best when pucks are getting thrown to the net and there's a scrum in front because they they know what their big, strong guys, they're going to more often than not retrieve those pucks and get another look. And that's how the sagging goal went in. That's how some of their power play goals have looked. But, you know, if you're Minnesota, you can counteract that by continuing to make good clears and, and make, you know, get a better angle on some of those longer shots and block them before they get to the net because Dallas is really good around that blue paint. Ultimately, the Wilds come up just a little bit short in this one, and we head back to Dallas with a 2-2 series tie. 
We will have you covered after game five. We'll have you covered after game six. We'll have you covered however long this series ends up going. So make sure that you uh, stay tuned to Locked on Wild for uh, all of your post-game recaps. Kevin, thanks for the time here live from the X. Uh, We'll do it again on Tuesday night. Listeners, make sure you tune in for all of our new episodes of Locked on Wild, breaking down every detail of this series as we go throughout the week. You can find all of our episodes as part of the Locked on Podcast Network.